Alright, good to see everybody here. Got a lot of people who weren't sick and weren't doing good and are back, so that's good. Um, I heard a pretty good joke a couple of days ago. So I'm going to start out with that. Um, there was a man working on his roof and uh, he was up there working, 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 and he slipped and he fell and he came all the way down and he was hanging onto the gutters. And uh, he started looking down and he didn't see nobody. He started saying, is anybody down there? Hey, is there anybody down there? Hey, help, help, is anybody down there? And nobody, nobody, nobody. So he started looking up and said, hey, hey, is there anybody up there? Is there anybody up there? Anybody up there? Help, help. And then he heard a voice from heaven said, Trust me and let go. He looked up. Trust me and let go. Hey, is there anybody else up there? I'm going to do a service on laughter one of these times. The Bible says a merry heart's like medicine, and it really it produces in our body endorphins. When we have a joyful heart, it's it's health to our body. There's a lot of medical stuff in the Bible that that, that I don't know if we really get it, man. When we we decide to rejoice in the Lord, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. It doesn't matter what you're going through, and we've been going through some really hard times here lately. But it doesn't stop us from rejoicing and praising God. Uh, spiritual warfare spiritual warfare I want to talk a little bit about that today I don't know when we rest because I don't rest John 10 10 Jesus said that that he come to bring life and abundant life and he's but he also said that Satan comes to kill steal and destroy Paul told us that that we are spiritual warfare against uh, the powers of darkness and and uh satanic uh, influences but through a lot of tough days the last couple of days are really tough I really believe my wife being here today is a miracle because she was doing so bad for the last two days it was, it was just really really hard um, but like I said a little bit earlier you know it's we we need to go to war we need to go to war because I've seen Christians sit there and they're depressed and they're and they're just letting Satan kicked their butt and, and, and they're not they're not going to war and uh, um, I was in the Bible yesterday for about four or five hours and the Lord kept showing me all kinds of stuff it's really cool I just uh, kind of took most of the day I might have been longer than that but I don't know once I get in the Bible and get lost in it it just time just goes by but uh, I, I got a really cool message uh, it's it's I don't know the best way I can explain it is is like uh, when we got these fireworks we got this little frog firework and it just comes and comes and comes then it kind of stops then it starts coming again throwing out and like this is what was going on yesterday it was just like God just kept throwing 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 stuff out and then he, when he thought he was done he started throwing more stuff out and throwing more stuff out but this is a really cool message today uh, I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm going to talk today about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. And, you know, if you went and talked to everybody about the fear of the Lord, we'd probably have 20 different, 30 different definitions of what we thought the fear of the Lord is. But the thing I do, I love to go to the Hebrew. I love to go to the Hebrew and find out. Because when you get the Hebrew mindset about the Word of God, you're, you're going right to the source. Because this Bible wasn't written by God in English it was written by God in Hebrew and uh, and sometimes we don't get the full understanding because we don't know the Hebrew uh, foundation of it the Hebrew word for fear is yea rear yea rear and uh, it's a pretty cool word a lot of times you read, I got a Hebrew book, I'm not a Hebrew expert, but I, I do study it a lot. It means the hand you see. 
the hand you see. Now, when you, when you hear that, you're thinking like, that, I'm not going to, that don't make no sense. I, I, the hand you see, that's the fear of the Lord, the fear, the hand you see. When we get done with this message, uh, uh, you're going to see it. You're going to see it. That word, is, it has a dual meaning. It means to be terrified. Fear, it means to be terrified. But it also means an awesome reverence, too. So when we say the fear of the Lord, it, it, does, it does have a, the, the meaning of terrified, but it also means an awesome reverence. Um, I kind of think about my dad. You know, uh, he didn't terrify us, but when he got mad and pulled his belt, when he started pulling his belt out of his loops, uh, yeah, there was a little bit of terrifying there. But it was an awesome reverence, too. And, and that's the best way I can try and explain this. But if we look in the Bible, and remember when Moses went to the burning bush and, and God spoke to him out of the burning bush, the Bible said Moses hid his face and he was afraid to look at God. That, that's an awesome reverence, but that's an also being terrified, too. Remember the angels of the Lord and the glory of the Lord came to the shepherds out in the field when they announced Jesus Christ coming. As the Bible said that the shepherds were greatly afraid. Okay, what about the wise men when they came to worship Jesus and they came and they bowed down and they presented their gifts to him? The awesome reverence. We could see the awesome reverence they had for Jesus. Remember when Abraham might be the best example ever that he was commanded to take Isaac up and offer him up to God. And he took Isaac up to the hill, Mount Moriah, and he offered him to God. He was ready to put the knife into his son. And what did God say? He said, Now I know that thou fearest me, seeing that you will not withhold your only son from me. Again, the awesome reverence that, that, that this word fear means. What about Solomon when he opened up, built the temple, and he opened it up? He came and offered 22,000 oxen to the Lord and 120,000 sheep. We're trying to get this reverence thing in here. This reverence thing in here. How do we feel about God? Again, the word means the hand you see. Hand you see. I'm going to try to explain that. The Bible speaks a lot about the hand. We know about the hand as we raise our hands up to worship God. The, the letter hey is the number fifth by fifth uh, uh, alf, fifth word in the alphabet hey and and when you praise God this is how the Jews praise God and hey and five and grace and blessing the Bible has a lot to say about our hands the Bible has a lot to say about God's hands God's hands created us God's by God's hands we're saved God's hands protects us God's hand provides for us uh, if we go to Psalm 16. Verse 11, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I tell you what, you start studying hands in the Bible, and you, you, you're going to be there for days, not just hours. But Psalm 16, verse 11. The psalmist said, Speaking to God, he said, Thou will show me the path of life. God, God, God's not a God up there, and we're down here, and we're confused about what to do. The Bible says that, that the Lord will show us the path of life, and in thy presence is fullness of joy. The reason we don't have fullness of joy is because we're not in the presence of God enough. Very simple. When we're in the presence of God, God says there's fullness of joy. When we've been going through the hard times we've been going through with my mom and dad, and with Patty's knee and the pain and Lauren's pain, there's still fullness of joy because we're in the presence of God. And then it says, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I wish I had time to really get into teaching about the hand. I'm just going to throw us a little bit out there, give you a little taste of it. Get yourself a concordance, get in there and study yourself. Uh, I might bring more next week. But there's a verse in the Bible that's really cool. Um, if we go to Psalm 78, verse 42. A lot of people will read the Bible and they'll just go through this and they, they didn't really understand or get what it meant. They, they didn't really, they really did, didn't catch it. Psalm 78, 
Psalm 78, verse 42. God speaking here. I'm going to try and do this as best I can. Is that a camera or just a... Okay, all right. Look what it says in Psalm 78, verse 42. They remember not his hand. Speaking of God. They remember not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. He, God's here, and if we keep reading it, it's talking about when God delivered the Jews out of Egypt, okay? And it speaks about all the things he did, all the plagues he threw on them, all the, the miracles he performed. He parted the Red Sea, the, the, the fire that kept the Egyptians from catching them, the, the fire that led them by night, and then the Shekinah glory that led them by day. But the thing I want you to see is they remembered not his hand. They forgot about what God did for them. They forgot about what God did for them. And this word fear means the hand you see. God's hand. You see how God's hand? You should see God's hand on your life. That's the fear of the Lord. To see God's hand on your life. To see what God has done for you. His salvation most of all. I love the name of Yahweh. God's name. It means to behold the hand and behold the nail. Even his name has a hand in it. It's awesome. It's awesome. The hand you see. God said they didn't remember his hand. They didn't see it no more. They forgot about what God did for them. And that's why they don't fear him no more. And they don't reverence him no more. I see the hand of God every day in my life. I wake up every day and remember how Jesus saved me 28 years ago. How he saved a wretch like me. How I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind but now I see. I see the hand of God every day as he's blessing us. Every single day. Every minute of every day. And even through the hard times and the times when I got to see my wife be in so much pain. Or see my mom frustrated because my dad doesn't know what he's doing anymore. I see his hand. I see his hand. Even when he fell and he had the ten... Uh, staples on his head I thank God that, that, that it wasn't worse it wasn't worse when he falls and he lands on his butt not his head I'm praise the Lord <laughs> when I don't get a call at 3 or 4 in the morning your dad's down on the floor and come over and hell I, I praise the Lord when Patty finally falls asleep and she's not moaning and groaning in pain no more I'm praising the Lord I'm sitting there praising Jesus praise you praise you praise you praise you praise you Jesus There are many promises to those who fear the Lord. I'm going to look at a couple. Let's go to Psalm 34, verse 9. And you see, I, I talked a few weeks about the people who are dull of hearing. They, they'll, they'll come here and they hear this message, and they hear it with their ears, but it never gets to their heart and it never gets to their life. And it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. The Word of God should change us. When we hear something, the Word of God should change. We should be changing and changing and changing and changing and becoming more and more and more like Jesus as we grow spiritually. Look at what we have a promise here from our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Psalm 34, verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear them. There's no want or there's no lack. God's not a God of lack. He's a God of abundance. He's an abundant God. El Shaddai, the abundant God. There's no lack to those who fear Him. You know who has lack? Those who don't fear Him. Those who don't fear Him. Those who don't reverence Him. Those who aren't. I, I got to fear God. I really do. I love Jesus. I know Jesus loves me. I reverence him, but you know, there's a part of me that I, I, I have a fear of God. I am not going to go where he doesn't want me to go because I've seen in the Bible what he does. I see in the Bible what he does. Just like my dad. I, I know what I was doing, that, or not me, but Steve mostly. I know when Steve was doing that stuff, it wasn't going to end that well. And I saw that and I learned from that. 
Um, I, I I got a fear of the Lord. I really do. I mean, I, I, I got the, the terrified fear, too. You know, I, I, I'm not dumb enough to think that, that, that he, he corrected David. <laughs> David was a man of his own heart. He, there ain't no way he ain't going to correct me. Um, there's no lack. There's no lack. I don't have any lack in my life. I don't. I got a lot of pain and, and trouble and sorrows, but I don't have any lack in my life. The Lord has given me everything I could possibly want. His word is true. If there's lack in your life, you might want to look at this verse. Because God promises those who fear the Lord will not have lack. There's one more I want to read. Uh, Psalm 115. Psalm 115, verse 13. It says, He will bless them that fear the Lord. He will bless them that fear the Lord. You know, 90% of Christians don't fear the Lord. They don't. I can prove it. Remember the story about the ten lepers? And Jesus healed the ten lepers and only one of them came back. Only one of them came back to thank Jesus. I'm big. I'm big on that 10% thing because God's big on it. I remember when Ed came here, I first told Ed, I said, look at the bar. Look at the bar poles. You guys can get it on your phone. I don't know how to do them phone things, but you guys do. Go look at the bar poles, which is the Christian poles that come out every year. I've been saved 28 years, and every year it's the same thing. 90% of the Christians don't tell anybody about Jesus. 90% of the Christians aren't really serving Jesus in any capacity. And 90% of the Christians are not giving Jesus his high. That's where I come up with it. It's biblical. It's right out of the Bible. One out of ten. I could preach on that message, but that's not my message today. Most Christians, 90%, I'll say, don't have the fear of the Lord. They're not afraid to ignore God's commandments. There's no fear there. There's no fear there. They don't have a fear of the Lord. They, they, don't, they don't believe that, that there's anything to be afraid of. I, that's, that's not where I'm at. I, I, I have a fear of the Lord. If, if, I, if I go outside of what He wants me to do and, 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 and disobey His commandments... I, I got a real good fear that, that he's going to take me out to the woodshed and, and uh, explain to me why I need to obey him. But today, I think we get too comfortable with God. We get too comfortable with him. Oh, he's my friend. Yeah, he loves me and all that. But But he's also... He's also the Almighty God, the Sovereign God, who, who makes commandments and expects them to be followed. And if there's not a fear of God in your life, then, then, you, then you're missing something, because there should be. That's why I'm so proud of this church. I really am. I, I grade this church, and I think it's a five-star church, because I see what we have here. I see the fear of the Lord in the people here. I see the love of Jesus Christ in this church. And that's why, you know, we might not be the, the big uh, multi-thousand people church that, that there are out there, but I, I'd take this church over any church. I would. The, the, the percentage of people that we have here who are faithful to God and loving God and reverence God and have that fear of God, I, I, I'd take that over, and, you know, percentage-wise, I would take that over any church. I really would. This is pretty cool. All right, we, we we all know about the hand, right? The five five fingers. Well, I got five number of grace. God's name, Uh Hey, is the fifth fifth letter in the alphabet. A man sitting there praising God. That's what the the Hebrew letter looks like. Um, five 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 five. Grace, 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 grace. 
There's five times in the Bible that God said to learn to fear the Lord. Pretty cool. Five times. Guess which book it's in? They're all in one book. Guess which book it's in? The fifth book. Pretty cool. You know, the fifth book, the book of Deuteronomy, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy more than any other of the scriptures. Five times, the fifth book. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Again, God, God I love numbers because God loves numbers. He's big on numbers. And if you can figure out what the number is, what God's doing with his numbers, you're, you're going to understand some things. But again, it's not a coincidence. There's no word for coincidence in the Hebrew language. There's no word for coincidence in God's language or in his kingdom. There's no coincidence. Everything is by design. In Levit Leviticus, God said that the tithe is mine. 10% of all your increase is mine. If you want to debate it or you want to disbelieve it, then, then talk to Jesus because I, I want to dis debate it with you. It's, it's, it's what he says. I believe it. Jesus said it. God said it. That's the way it is. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, this is God speaking. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. So all their increase, they had to give God 10%. That's his law. That's a spiritual law. It's not any different than the law of gravity. If you jump off this roof, you're going to go down. It's the same thing. It's the same type of law. God's got spiritual laws. He's got physical laws. And they're all, there's no variance in them. They're exactly the way he said it would be. So in verse 23, it says, Thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. Where's that at? Where's the place that he chose to put his name? House of the Lord. House of the Lord. It's the only place he chose to put his name. That tabernacle was the house of the Lord. When, when Moses wandered in the wilderness and that tabernacle was movable. When Solomon came and made the temple, it became permanent, but it was the same thing. It was the place they went to worship the Lord. It was called the house of the Lord, and it was called the house of the Lord when he made the temple. So he said, bring your tithe to the house of the Lord. And then he said, the tithe of the corn, and of the wine, and of the oil, and of the firstlings of thy herds, and of thy flocks. You think it's a coincidence that he named five things there? Huh? You think that might be a coincidence? The corn, the wine, the oil, the first of the herds and the first of the flocks. It's not a coincidence. Five. And then he says that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Why did God instruct him to bring the tithe? He tells you right here. He tells you right here that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord always. That's what the tithe is all about. God's trying to teach us something. And the tithe is more of a reverence. It's more of a reverence. If we go to Proverbs 3. The whole, the whole uh, chapter of Proverbs 3 is awesome, but I, I just want to jump in in uh, verse 9. Again, who wrote Proverbs? Solomon. The man who God gave more wisdom than any other man. Am I, we might want to listen to this because he's got the wisdom of God like nobody ever else said. But look what he says. Honor the Lord with thy substance or thy wealth 
and with the first fruits of all thine increase. That's the tithe. But then he also has a promise behind it. So that thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. There's a blessing attached to it. I love giving to God. Not just his tithe, but offerings. The Bible talks about tithes and offerings. The tithe. I'm not giving the tithe to God. There's nowhere in the Bible that says to give the tithe to God. It says bring the tithe to God because it's not yours to give. It says bring the tithe to God. It's his and you're bringing it to him. It never says give the tithe to God. But it says to give offerings. So I give 10% or I, <laughs> I offer 10% to the Lord because that's his. But then, out of the 90 that he gives me, I love giving him offerings. And you know what? His word is true. His word is true. In Malachi chapter 3, he said, you bring me the tithes. He said, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour out so many blessings, there's not enough room to receive it. Sign me up, Jesus. If you want to ask me what my life has been like since I got saved for 28 years, he's opened the windows of heaven and poured out so many blessings, there's not enough room to receive it. Why? Because I fear the Lord. I fear the Lord, and the way I show that, and one of the ways I show it is I bring him his tithe. Let's go to Malachi 3. There's only two things you can do with the tithe. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, right before Matthew. There's only two things you can do with, with God's tithe. You can either bring it to Him or you can rob it from Him. That's all there is. There's nothing else. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. Look, look what Jesus says, or look what the uh, God says in Malachi chapter 3. If we look at verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your father, you've gone away from my ordinances, has not kept them. You've not kept my word. Remember, return unto me, and I will return unto you, say the Lord of hosts. But you say, wherein shall we return? God says, I've left you. He said, you return unto me, and I'll return unto you. And they said, where shall we return? And then God says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you say, where have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. God says, you robbed me in my tithes and offering. You know what they're saying to God? You know what they're saying to God? When they rob him of his tithes and offering? I don't reverence you. I'm not grateful for what you've done for me. I don't think about the blessings you poured out on me. And then God says in verse 9, You're cursed with the curse, for you robbed me, even this whole nation. Do you know that the book of Malachi was the last book that was written in the Old Testament? And you know God left Israel for 400 years? And this is the last thing he has to say to him. But let's look on the other side of it. Let's look on the good side of it. Look what he says. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, his house, the house of the Lord. And he says, prove me or test me. This is the only place where God says to test him in the whole Bible. If you don't believe it, test me. Test me if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings that there's not enough room to receive it. I, I, I don't understand how 90% of the Christians don't believe this, but they don't. They're so disconnected from God. They're so disconnected from the Holy Spirit. I, I, all Jesus has done for me, if, if he wouldn't have done anything else but save me from the fires of hell. I was on the path of destruction. I knew I was on the path of destruction. It was not going to be good for me. I was on a very, very dangerous path. If he wouldn't have never done anything else for me, I'd be bringing my tithes and offering him for the rest of my life. I can't even... I can't even tell you all the numbers of prayers. I, I bet there's over a million prayers that he's answered. Some of the big ones. He's healed my mom of cancer. 
he brought Patty into my life. Uh, I uh, <laughs> I thank him for my wife every day. I know what it was like to be alone because when I got saved, I was alone for two and a half years because I was trying to wait on God for my wife, and and uh, I walked away from all my whole life things and and. Uh, Boy, when he brought Patty into my life, I was praising, praising, praising Jesus. He fed, he saved my whole family. He healed me of prostate cancer about five, six years ago. Yeah. I'm not one that will forget his hand. I'm not one that's going to forget the hand of blessing that he's put on my life for 28 years. And then look what he says in verse 11. First he says, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on you. There's not enough room to receive it. And then he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. That's Satan. I will rebuke the devourer. I, 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 I will go against Satan on your behalf. I will rebuke the devourer, and he shall not destroy the fruits of the ground, neither shall your vine cast their fruits by the time, the time of the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, and you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord. And your words have been stout against me. And then God goes back to Israel, and he says, Your words have been stout against me. And you say, What have we spoken so much against thee? And God said, you have said it is vain to serve the Lord. You have said it's not worth anything to serve God. It's not worth anything to serve God. Look at what God's saying. And what profit is it that we have kept this ordinance? What, 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 what difference does it make if we obey God or not? And that we have walked mournfully before the Lord. And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. These people believe that they're still going to get blessed when they dishonor God by robbing Him of His tithe. There's a lot of Christians that have that mindset too. They do. Oh, Jesus loves me. Oh, He does love you. He does love you. Yeah, my dad loved me too, but when he started pulling that belt off, he's going to show me his love in a whole different way. I got to fear the Lord. I, I go if you want to rob, if you need money that bad, go rob Walgreens or Jewel or even a bank. Don't don't be crazy enough to rob God. Don't be crazy enough to rob God. Those who rob God of their tithe, they, they don't have the fear of the Lord. They don't. I'm just being honest with you. God said in the book, I'm not saying it, I'm saying it. They don't reverence God. You know what the word tithe means? My sir. It means to see or recognize the prince. You... When you rob God, you, you don't see who He is. You don't really see who He is. You don't see who He is. You don't get it. You don't understand that He's the sovereign God Almighty, the Lord of the Lord, the King of Kings, our Savior and our God. You don't understand it. You don't understand. You can rob Him. You got no idea who He is. You have no idea who He is. Kind of reminds me, but before I got saved, you know, ever, ever, you know, in a bar drinking and stuff, and somebody kind of come up, give you some mouth or something, you know, and it's like, you know, I'll use Fernando for example, but I don't want to use me. You don't even know who he is. <laughs> Go steal Fernando's wallet that's sitting on the bar. You'll find out who he is real quick. You'll find out who he is real quick. People who rob God, they have no idea who he is. Oh, I can rob God and everything's going to be just fine. You got, you don't have any idea who God is. You don't have any idea who he is. We 
we can see how much Solomon feared the Lord, can't we? He brought 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep and offered them to God. We could see how much he reverenced God. We could see how much Abraham reverenced God, couldn't we? Could you imagine God telling you to take your son up to a hill, make a, a, a an altar, put wood around it, and then put a knife through your son's chest? And he was ready to do it. He had the knife up, ready to do it, and God said, stop. He said, now I know that thou fearest me. We could see how much Abraham feared the Lord. What about when the wise men came and they bowed down and they offered their treasures to Jesus? You could see how much they reverenced Him. Bowing down is an act of worship in the Bible. And Jesus was just a young boy at that time. And the Bible says that they offered their treasures unto him. I don't understand these 90% of the Christians. I really don't. I really don't. I, I love to give to God. After all he's done for me, I love to give to God. It's one of the reasons he called me to be up here. Because I, I, I got the fear of the Lord. He wouldn't, he wouldn't call me to be a pastor if I didn't have the fear of the Lord. If I didn't reverence Him. I, I don't bring my message to you guys every Sunday. I pray all week and I pray a lot on Saturday night. And I ask the Lord to give me the message that you guys need to hear. This is not, this is not Bill Sandoval's message to you. This is Jesus' message to you. And I know so many of our people are, are tithers. They, they believe in that and they, they, they love giving to the Lord just like I do and they're grateful to the Lord just like I am and they fear the Lord just like I do and they reverence the Lord just like I do. And, and, and there's nothing better. There's nothing better. I was debating whether to tell this story or not because I, I'm not trying to elevate myself by any means. I'm really not. I don't do that. I'm not comfortable with that. But when we were still at the La Quinta Inn, how many were at La Quinta Inn with us? We had some, some, a lot of the people that used to be there with us can't come to church no more for health reasons and stuff. But, but we, used, we were there for almost two years. And we rent the conference room and we had church services out there because we didn't have no money. We just started. And, uh, I remember one one day I, I preached on the, the rich young ruler. And that's the guy who told Jesus, oh, I keep all God's commandments. And Jesus said, oh, yeah, really? He said, well, if you want to be perfect, he said, then sell everything you have and come and follow me. He said, come, sell it and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And uh, I was laying in bed that night. Patty was sleeping, and I was thinking about that. And we had been looking for a church building at the time and we've been going here and there here and there we haven't we really weren't finding anything uh, uh, that we wanted and I just remember telling the Lord I said you know what because we didn't have no money we just started you know we we didn't have enough money to buy a church and I told the Lord I said you know what I'll sell my house and buy your buy your house buy a church you know I made that offer to him and I was serious about it um, that's how much I reverence the Lord. You know, I, you know, giving Him ten percent—that's—that's. You know, if He wanted twenty, I'd give Him twenty. If He wanted thirty, I'd give Him thirty. You know what? He would take care of me. Ninety percent with God on my side, backing me up, blessing everything I do is better than a hundred percent without Him. I don't understand it. Where, where are the preachers that should be preaching this in the churches? How can 90% of the Christians not have this kind of fear of the Lord in their lives? I don't understand it. Are the churches that, that, that 
stale? Are the preachers that afraid to preach on tithing? I love Dr. David Jeremiah. You know what he used to do? Every January, his whole January would be on tithing. Because he figured it's the first of the year, it's about tithing. The first, he'd, te he'd teach on tithing the whole, the whole month of January. And you know what he said? This is out of his mouth. He said, yeah, I preach on tithing the whole first year, the whole month of January, every year. And he did that for years. He doesn't do it anymore, but he did that for years. He said, you know what? Our attendance is so low in January, you can't believe it. They don't want to come in here. When I heard it for the first time, I said, sign me up, Jesus. You mean you're going to open up the windows of heaven and pouring out blessings? There's not a room. How, how, how much... How much, how much was it worth to be saved? Huh? Could you put a price on that? I couldn't. Everything I have and everything I ever had would not be enough for me to be saved. If God said, give me everything you got, and I'll let you into heaven, I would give him everything I got. What's the price on your salvation? What's the price? Can I put a price on my mom being healed by cancer? Can't put a price on that. I can't put a price on my wife. Man, I love our home. I love my wife. I love our life. I love our house. Can't put a price on that. No matter what's going on all around us, when I go home, and there's peace and there's joy and there's happiness and laughter and kindness. Put a price on that. I can't. When he healed me of prostate cancer five or six years ago, can't put a price on that. Can't put a price. I don't get it. I, I, just, I just can't get it. You say you're a Christian, you say you believe in God, you say you trust in God, and, 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 and yet you would rob him? I, I, I didn't say the tithe, I, I didn't make that up. God did. God said the tithe is mine. I didn't go there, but I am going to go there. Let's, let's go to Leviticus, the last chapter of Leviticus. I, I, just, I didn't go there, I should have went there. You know, the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, is the holiest book in the Bible. It's the name where Yahweh is in quoted into the Bible. And every 50, it's, it's not a coincidence, every 50 letters you'll find you, hey, Rai, every 50 letters. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. And what's cool about it, it's the last thing he has to say. You know, when, when every time you see something, the last thing you have to say in any of the books of the Bible, it's the most important. What's the last thing Jesus says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John? What's the last thing he says? Every one of them in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. The last thing he says is go out and preach the word of God. Go out and preach the word of God. So this is kind of cool because this is the last thing God has to say in Leviticus. Look what he says, verse 30. All the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. You're not only stealing from the Lord, you're taking something holy from the Lord. In verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flocks, even whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. We got our Where's our offerings? We got our offering things right here. When church is over and I'm standing over there, you know what? I'm not I'm not looking at these things. I'm not afraid somebody's going to steal something out of it. I don't think nobody would steal something out of it. We wouldn't go to Walgreens and steal stuff. We wouldn't go to Jewel and steal stuff. We wouldn't we wouldn't go any any place and steal stuff. 
But 90% of the Christians believe it's our right to steal from God. It's crazy. It's crazy. You can't buy God's blessings. But when you honor Him with your tithes, and you reverence Him, and show that you fear Him by giving Him His tithes, He makes you a promise. And I can tell you this promise is true because I've been living it for 28 years. He said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out more blessings on you. He said, so many blessings that there won't be enough room to receive them all. I don't know how we can see it any other way. I just don't know. And I've preached this so many times. I love preaching on tithing. I love because there's some foundations that, that, that if, if you want that abundant life that Jesus talks about in John 10.10, 10, this is one of the foundations. Church is another foundation to be here every week. Studying the Word of God. Tithing. Spreading His gospel. Serving Him in some capacity. We got so many servants, and Lauren's down there right now serving the Lord, taking care of the kids. Jennifer's the other one is helping serving with the kids. You know, the girls come in and they're serving the Lord by saying, "I'm serving. I'm the biggest servant in the church. I'm serving Jesus Christ by coming up here and doing this." We got together Saturday. We served the Lord. John vacuumed the the, the rugs. Look, rugs look pretty good, John. They didn't get that way them uh, by themselves. The bathrooms are clean. Dominic was down there cleaning the bathrooms. He cleaned the steps. Um, Val come and shovel the, the snow when we had that last snow. He's been shoveling the snow and raking leaves. He's, we're serving. You know, we got so many servants in this church. Krista with the, the videos and Zach with the videos. And, and you know, we're, we're everybody, you know, this is not a one-man show. We're, we're serving the Lord because we fear Him. We fear Him. We have a reverence for Him. I, I, I want to do something for Jesus. I, I wish I could do more. I, I pray all the time. Oh, Lord, heal my legs because I, I want to do more. I don't want to be limited in what I'm doing for you. I, 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 I want to do more than I'm doing now. I want to give more than I'm giving now. Uh, when, when Patty was going through these two days of pain, you know, I, I had a really good talk with the Lord. And I just, you know, I told the Lord, you know, I went to war for her. You know, praying, that, that's good. How about fasting? That's a weapon we don't use. The Bible tells us in Matthew 7 that, that there's three, three things that we get our prayers answered. Giving, prayer, and fasting. These are weapons. These are weapons that God gives us so that, that our prayers get answered. It's a miracle that she's here today. If you would have seen her for the last two days, you would have said there's no way she could be here. I prayed and fasted. I made a vow. I made a vow to God. Did we ever do that? Another weapon God gives us. I went to war for her last night. And I prayed and I said, Lord, I'm asking for a miracle that she'll be able to come to church this morning. That's a miracle of God right there. Because I use the weapons that God gave me. And he answered those prayers. And it all starts because I have a fear of the Lord. I reverence Him. I praise Him in the storm. I ain't going to stop praising Him. I ain't going to stop rejoicing. I ain't going to stop, stop reverencing no matter what goes in my life. And that's, that's, you know, that's my testimony. And she's here today. I really believe if I wouldn't have gone to war for her yesterday, I really believe she probably wouldn't be here today. Let's bow our heads. Holy Father, mighty God, we thank you so much, Lord, for all you've done and blessed us with. Your great salvation, most of all, your difference on the cross. And Father, this is our foundation right here. Do we reverence you? Do we give you the glory and the honor that you deserve? Are you first in our life? Are you our Savior and our Lord? You said, why call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say?
Let us give you the reverence, the honor, and the glory that's due you, Lord. Let us not forget the blessings and the grace of your hands, the works you've done in our life, especially our salvation. Thousands and thousands and thousands of other ways you've taken care of us, protected us, provided for us, answered our prayers in so many ways. You've given us so much, Lord. I know this church is, is founded on the fear of the Lord. What we do here is because we fear you and reverence you. And I pray to God, Lord, that this message touches everybody's heart. And it is a test. It's a test. You told us that in Malachi 3. Test me. It's a test. Do you reverence me? Take the test. <laughs> Take the test. Don't rob the Lord of your tithes because you're really robbing yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. Cleansed by His blood, join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.